So um, Rathlin really is um, one of the, the, the very best places for marine life in Europe. Um, uh, this is a bit of a, a whistle stop. There's so much cover and what I hope to do this evening is really to just give those of you who have never sort of dived beneath the surface uh, uh, just a glimpse of the, the vast array of marine life and habitats that occur around Rathlin. Sorry. So Rathlin is situated um, on the northeast corner of Northern Ireland. Um, and it's just approximately 10 kilometres from Bally Castle. Um, here you can see the Mull of Kintar. So it's actually very close to the, the west coast of Scotland. Uh, most people, when they arrive on Rathlin, they get the ferry. You can see here it goes from Bally Castle across to Church Bay. And if you haven't visited the island, it, it really it's it's beautiful to explore on land as well. So this this is a photo that I took last year from the southeast corner of the island, looking across to the the white cliffs here. Um, it's a lot of the island is uh, ASSI, so there's, there's geological interest, botanical interest, and a lot of the pasture is is unimproved. So there's uh, the flora is very nice as well. Um, it's famous for its uh, seabird colonies. They're the, the largest that we have in Northern Ireland. Um, this is up in the, um, the west of the island. Um, and what you can see here are mostly guillemots, although there's lots of razor bills and puffins and gannets as well, black guillemots. Um, so, yeah, really, really worth exploring. Um, I put this little bit of video in. I, I hope it comes across. Sometimes video can be strange on Zoom. Um, this was uh, in July of 2021. If you got the ferry across to Rathlin during um, those weeks, um, you were almost certain to be greeted by a, a large pod of bottlenose dolphins. And we were up there with our boat. So this is a, a bit of... Uh, um, 40 seconds of video of these bottlenose dolphins um, that were, I think there were at least 50 all around the boat. Um, and you can see how clear the water is as well. That's not me, that was my son's friend. <laughs> <laughs> he was stupid and she was so on the way out, she said, Do you think we might see a dolphin? And I was thinking, it might be a porpoise all the way out. Yeah. Yeah. Dolphins that were in the area. So um and in summertime, you might also be lucky enough to see um, the largest fish that we get in our waters, and this is the basking shark. Um, they can be up to more than, than 30 feet um, in length, um, and they go along very close to the surface of the, the um, water feeding. Um, Rathlin Island was designated a marine conservation zone in 2016. You can see here this. The, the, this black perimeter shows the extent of the, the conservation zone. And then within that, this green area is the special area of conservation for the marine species and habitats, and also a special protection area for the, the seabirds. Um, and that was a really significant thing um, in terms of what the protection that it's offered um, the habitats and species that occur around Rathlin. Um, why is Rathlin so important for, from a marine nature conservation perspective? Um, there are a large number of um, habitats that are deemed priority habitats for conservation, um, and especially the, the fragile sponge and anthozoan habitat. Uh, Rathlin, in quite a 
the people's opinion, including mine, has the best examples of this in Europe. It really is fabulous. It also has a large number of what we call priority species. So these are Northern Ireland priority species from a conservation thing. Um, and the diversity of species is high. And also um, its uniqueness. So there are species that we find on Rathlin that we find nowhere else in Northern Ireland, or at least they're, they're very rare elsewhere. Um, and compared to um, the rest of our, our inshore coastal waters, it's still in a, in a relatively natural state. And below here are just a, a couple of the photographs of the underwater habitats. And I'm going to be covering some of the habitats and the species, including um, some of the marine priority species that occur there. Um, this photograph of underwater raffling was taken back in the 1984 as part of the survey around the Northern Ireland coast. I'm looking at habitats and species. Um, you can see here these boulders and then surrounding uh, shelly gravel with these large erect sponges, cup-shaped sponges and branching sponges and little cup corals. And um, they co-occur with scallops. And I think going back to the 1980s when they first started looking around Rathlin underwater, um, they could see that this area was vulnerable to um, mobile bottom fishing, especially scallop dredging, as the scallops co-occurred in this area. Um, and the recommendations from that survey were that, that this area got protected. Um, here's a photograph of the king scallop, which is the was the target fishery for um, that in that area. Um, this is a photograph of a scallop dredger off Church Bay that was taken in 2007. In 2016, and this date is significant, as you see, we were talking here about the EU Habitats Directive, um, which um, says that, you know, habitats and um, priority habitats should be um, maintained in a favourable state. Um, and it was really important because in 2016, um, the DR Marine Group, and I see Joe Green is, is in the audience, um, managed to get a, a ban on bottom fishing and on gear such as scallop dredging um, within the special area of conservation. And that has really been fantastic for protecting those very vulnerable habitats. Um, so what makes Rathlin um, different to other areas and quite special? Um, there's different factors. Um, the actual bathymetry, so that's the seabed and the depth contours um, are important, but also what happens with the tidal streams. Um, this is the flow tide going in as it goes along the north coast, filling up into the Irish Sea. And um, so as it as it comes along, it splits and runs around both sides of the island. And then when it's emptying out of the Irish Sea, it comes along and hits the east coast and then splits and runs in these directions. That tide combined with the, the shape of the island and the bathymetry create a lot of different speeds of tidal currents um, and mixing um, of the water column. Um, and that is um, plays a, a, a factor in uh, creating a diversity of habitats, but also the, the depth that we get around Rathlin. Um, if we look here up on the uh, northwest corner, when we zoom in, we look at these depth contours. So here's Rucallum Point. We just go a little bit offshore. We've got, we're down to 200 metres. So these cliffs just drop. Um, and having that proximity of deep water close to the inshore um, is also a factor in, in why it's so special. Um, I was going to show you some photographs of an underwater archway that we get off Luke Callan. Um, this is the um, at the top, just above the archway, where we have um, beautiful, rich kelp forests. 
This is the kelp Laminaria hyperborea, um, which is the main sort of forest kelp. And you can see it's got lots of um, different foliose red algae growing on the stipes and around it. And then on the sides of the rock, soft corals and sponges and sea anemones. And you can see how clear the water is. And then this is the archway itself. The top of the archway is about 28 metres. Um, this white and orange fuzzy thing you can see is a soft coral, Alcyonium digitatum, and it's very common on the arch. And then the little yellow colonial anemone you can see is what we're calling um, Parazonthus axonelli, and it's a, a Northern Ireland priority species. And this archway is, it's really spectacular. And when divers go to Rathlin, um, one of the places they often want to go is, is the archway and do it as a swim through. Um, just on the right of the photo, you can see a little soft pink fuzzy thing. And that's another soft coral, um, Alcyonium hibernicum. And it was, when it was originally described as a species, it was described from Southwest Ireland and, and hence the name hibernicum. And here it is again. In the picture, then the soft coral Alcyonium digitatum, and then the orange little sort of big bean things you can see is a sea squirt. And um, some people call it the big bean sea squirt. It's its Latin name, and I, I use Latin names a lot in this talk because so much of the marine invertebrates just don't have common names. Um, and also it, it saves confusion. Some people use the same common name for different things. So um, it's always best when we're talking about species, if we, if we can use the scientific name where there's, especially when there's areas of confusion. And this is just another photo of that fragile priority habitat with um, vulnerable sponges and soft corals. So this is the soft coral, the Alcyonium. You can see lots of these sea anemones called Actinothoes paradita. And then there's so many different sponges here and lots of um, Devonshire cup corals, Caryophilia. So, I mean, it is worth just taking a minute to see when you go underwater, Almost every surface has something um, living on it, and the diversity, especially on Rathlin, is 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 overwhelming at times. Um, you can easily spend you know, most of most of a dive, you know, forty minutes underwater, exploring just maybe a, a couple of meters of surface. Um, and then the grey. That you can see here, this is a sponge. It's called the elephant's ear sponge, Pachymatismia johnstonia. Um, and that's um, huge. It can be over um, almost a meter across. Um, and then on the rock, there's lots of different encrusting sponges, some obsidians, and then again, this, this big bean squirt that you can see, and then the open pipe. Hydroids. Um, I appreciate that there's a lot here that people won't have come across before. And I probably will use lots of names you think, well, I'll never remember that. But the purpose of this talk was really just to let you see um, how much there is underwater on Rathlin. And these photographs were taken, the underwater photographs were taken by my, my husband, Bernard Picton. Um, so Hopefully, if nothing else, you will just get to see some very nice photographs and gain an appreciation of um, how special Rathlin is and you know, why, um, why so many people have endeavoured to protect this area and these habitats. So I think I mentioned about Northern Ireland priority species and this, this yellow, yellow colonial um, anemone parazoanthus axinella question mark um, so it's a priority species there's quite a bit of it on Rathlin um, Rathlin's the only place 
in Northern Ireland where this species occurs. So in terms of Rathland uniqueness, this is one of the things that we're, we're only um, getting on Rathland. But the reason I put a, a question mark beside its name is Parasanthus axonelli was originally described from the Mediterranean. And this photograph was taken near Marseille in 2005. You can see this is Parasanthus axonelli. It's growing on this sponge. The sponge it's growing on is called Axonella damicornis. Now, uh, we have a lot of Axonella damicornis on Rathlin. In fact, we even have an area on Rathlin called Damicornis Bay. So you can see this yellow sponge here is all Axonella damicornis. And we have lots of Parasanthus axonelli, but it doesn't grow on the damicornis. And there's some work now in the Mediterranean which indicates that Parasanthus axonelli is more than one species. It's uh, possible or likely that what we are getting on Rathlin isn't the same as what we're calling Parasanthus axonelli in the Mediterranean. Um, and of course, these things are important when we talk about um, connectivity and if a species gets wiped out in one area, where is it likely to be replaced from? So we really do need to understand the taxonomy um, of these things. And there's, there's so much to be done in the marine environment, and particularly with, with a, a lot of marine invertebrate groups in terms of really understanding what species we have. I'm going to go back to that actually because again this is this is one of those photographs where there's so much in it and you could almost spend the entire talk going through all of the different things. Most of them are sponges. So these these are erect yellow branching sponges, the yellow axonellas, these blue and yellow encrusting sponges, white goosebump sponge, etc. And then cup corals. Um, in terms of the cup corals, and we get these, we get two species on Rathlin, um, and this is again near, near that beautiful archway. Um, this one that has some orange on it and has iridescence is the common cup coral, um, Caryophyllia smithi. It's called the Devonshire cup coral. You can see it here and here. But then along this crevice, there is a smaller one that doesn't have any iridescence and doesn't have any of the orange colour. Um, and it's Caryophyllia inormata. And that's, um, again, one of the Northern Ireland priority species. Um, there's a close-up of it. The nodes on the end of the tentacles are also... Um, relatively larger than they are in Smith Eye, as well as not having the iridescence and the orange pigment. Um, Bernard Picton and Claire Goodwin um, did a lot of work on the, the sponge diversity of Rathlin um, back in the between 2005 and 2010. Um, and they published this paper on the sponge diversity of Rathlin, in which they described eight new species from the island. Um, this is a photograph of one of the divers during the survey. You can see they've got these beautiful big um, cameras for taking photographs of the habitats and the species. They've got a collecting bag where they collected small samples of the sponges. And this is a uh, cylinder with oxygen in it for decompressing. Um, I was just going to quickly show you a few of the species that they described from Rathlin. This one's Spongocerites calcicola, because the calcicola means loving limestone. Um, Axonella parva. Um, the Axonella parva, and quite a few of the species that they did describe, um, when I mentioned about Rathlin being unique, this is the distribution of Axonella parva on the National Biodiversity Network Atlas for Northern Ireland. And you can see it's been recorded from Rathlin and then from the Maidens of Clarn and nowhere else in Northern Ireland. 
And if we look at it on the Global Biodiversity Information Facility, GIBI, we can see that that's the only place in the world that species is known from. And that's the case for a number of these sponge species, which were recently described. Um, I know Bernard has looked elsewhere um, for some of these things, and there are one or two of them they have found in, in Scotland or in Wales, but mostly they haven't found them anywhere else. So the populations we have um, in Rathlin and in the mains in the North Channel um, really are important on a, a world scale. Um, this is just one of the other species. And you can see a lot of them are these encrusting sponges that, you know, being able to tie up what they look like in field, having these lovely underwater photographs and then looking at the internal characters um, really, really helps to, um, to you to go back out into the field and, and recognise them. Um, this one was named after Joe Brain, Hymerathia brainai. So uh, we woke up there. Just <laughs> so yeah, Joe jo has, has always been very instrumental in marine conservation in Northern Ireland. And I, I know he's recently been recognised in the, the New Year's Honours list for the work that he's done. So I think this is the first I've seen you since, Joe. So congratulations. Um, this is a golf ball sponge that it is, it's common all, all around our, our coasts, uh, Tethia citrina, it's called, um, and up until, you know, 2007, this was considered the only species of Tethia that, that we had. Um, and then Bernard had been, did some work with these uh, German um, sponge taxonomists, and he had collected this other tethia, which he was, you know, was sure was different to the tethia citrina. So um, they did work on the, the DNA and on the morphology, and they described this as a, a different species, um, tethia hibernica, in, in 2007. And again, I think that's only been um, recorded from that one. So how do we know if the sponge that we're looking at is a new species? Um, so we always begin by looking at the morphology. Um, sponges, they're invertebrates, but they have skeletons, but not just skeletons like we have that are made up of bones. They have these um, things called spicules. Um, most sponges have spicules that are made of glass. Um, they're tiny, so we need to do, we need to dissolve away the sponge and tissue and look at these, it, it, these in acid and look at these spicules and that are very small. So this is using a scanning electron micrograph. You can see here the scale. So that's 50 micrometers. Um, and these differences in sizes, different in, in ornamentation. Um, of these spicules help us to, to differentiate. Um, I've highlighted this, this one, Hymerathia stilifera. It was described by um, a taxonomist who was at the Natural History Museum in London called Barbank in 1864. And when he described that species, he designated a specimen as what we call the holotype. So his description was based on this specimen and that anchors the use of that name. So then when uh, Bernard and Claire were doing their survey, they found um, some other uh, material that they compared with this holotype. Um, and it's, holotypes are really important in museums and, and having museum vouchers are really important to make sure we are using names correctly. I and mean, we I think we have a new species to compare with, with existing material and, and uh, named species. So they described another two species. And then later on in, in 2018, I, I described a, an additional species. So the morphology is important using characters, um, dimensions, etc. cetera. Um, but we also rely on DNA sequences a lot now. Um, so this, is an alignment which I've done on the 
Hanarethia species, which I, I used in a, a paper that I did. Um, and you can see that this the sequences, they're made up, they have these different um, bases as part of the DNA sequence. Um, the color codes show when there's a, a, a disagreement in the alignment. And if you see these, these top two, they completely agree with each other. And they are the same species, but they're different to the bottom two. And you can see that while the bottom two are more similar to each other, they have differences between them as well. Yeah. Um, and if we do a pairwise matrix based on those DNA sequences, we can see how similar they are. There were two sequences of um, of Brini, should be high ratio, um, and they are 100% identical to each other. But then if we compare um, Brini with Stilifera, they are 94% similar, and with Vasiletti, 93. Um, so yeah, we this is, some of the things that we do whenever we're we're trying to decide whether we've got new species or not. And then in 2009, uh, Claire and Bernard described um, another six new species of Hymodesmia. And they called this one with these raised um, uh, uh, courses, Hamidesnia Rathlonai. So they named it after Rathlon Island. And, and I think that's, that's something that we should all like feel quite proud about. Um, so up in this western corner, um, if we go closely, we can see all this beautiful seabed mapping. This was done using multi-beam survey. Um, and you get this really detailed bathymetry that shows you um, what the seabed relief looks like um, and it's 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 really invaluable. Um, and you can see the, the that it's bedrock and it's very rugose. Um, and this area um, is where we get another one of our priority species. This is the crayfish. And you can see him out here on, on open rock, although they're much more common um, that you'll see them out at night than, than during the daytime. And this is a close-up of him. Alan Uh I think this is something that it's it's more of a southern species, so it's likely that that you know with the right protection it will become more, more common in Northern Ireland. Um, it's something that was more typical on the west coast of Ireland, but um, we do get it. Um, coming coming on round the coast now, and as, as sea temperature increases, we potentially could see more of them. And um, then on the east coast of Rathlin, along here, uh, we zoom in there with this uh, multi beam mapping. You can see this is the wreck of the Loch Garry on the east coast. This is a Fantastic wreck. It's very popular with divers, um, but it's also fantastic for marine life. Here you can see a diver with the underwater camera is photographing sea anemones and hydroids and the different marine life that's found on the wreck. And again, you can see how, how clear the water is on that one. Um, but we don't focus on the wreck for long. This is the seabed surrounding the wreck. Um, the boulder is covered in the cup coral Paraphilia smithi that I showed you earlier. These uh, stems you can see sticking up, these are what we call hydroids or seafarers, and there's a, a variety of different species here. And then hiding underneath the boulder, you can just make out these two long claws. And they belong to the long clawed squat lobster, Munida rugosa. And it's again another Northern Ireland priority species. You can see Rathlin is so important for so many of the, the species that are deemed to be of, of priority importance. Um, and they are feisty little creatures. They have these big long antennae and they'll, they'll come out and sort of do their pincer thing at you, but they're, they're not very big, so they're 
not at all dangerous. Um, and then this is the, the round crab, Atlas cyclus rotundatus, and again, you get it on the east coast of Bratwin, um, another priority species. Um, I think, you know, you'll see just in, in each of these photographs just how many other things there are. Um, you could, could spend so much time, you know, sharing with people the, the, the diversity. Um, so yeah, this is, you know, tonight is a whistle stop. Um, I think, uh, you know, when Kira introduced me, she said that, you know, my particular interest was sponges and, and nudibranchs. You know, nudibranchs are really my, my, my husband Bernard picked them. Um, he's, he's definitely like an obsessive when it comes to nudibranchs. I like them, but, but I'm not, not quite in, in the same league as him. Um, so he has, you know, done so much work on, on the nudibranchs. Um, this is one of the priority species that you get on that one, Catalinia dorula. Um, it looks quite well camouflaged there, but if we, this is a, a studio photograph of it, you can see it much more clearly here. And again, these things are maybe only, you know, one centimetre or 1.2 centimetres in, in length. Um, but they they are beautiful and they're diverse. And we have, I don't know, over 140 different species and they come in so many different colours and shapes. And they're very specific about you know, what they eat. Um, so often they'll, they'll really only feed on one particular species. Um, this is a photograph of the fan mussel. Um, a trina fragilis, um, and this was found near just on the seabed right next to the, the wreck of the Loch Gary. Um, again, another priority species and one that probably doesn't have a good future. Um, it's so susceptible to bottom fishing that the shell is, it's, it's, you know, it can be I don't know, 50, 60 centimetres in, in length, but I'm not sure how big it can get, but it, it's a, it's a lot, it can be, it can be very large. And, um, but the shell is delicate. So, you know, the, the populations of this fan mussel have been hammered. There's, there's another species of fan mussel that you get in the, the Mediterranean, um, Pinanobulus and a Apparently, last summer, which the Mediterranean got ridiculously hot, and it was wiped out as, as far as as far as the people who were, were surveying it could tell. Um, I, it did have a disease, but I think the the warm sea temperatures made it much more susceptible to uh, disease. Um, so this is the recorded distribution of this fan mussel. Um, and then there are a lot of these beautiful, diverse species of seafarers, and there's several that are Northern Ireland priority species that we get on Rathlin in the North Channel um, at the Maidens, and we don't get them anywhere else in Northern Ireland. I'm sticking in a few more nudibranchs because the nudibranchs tend to feed on these uh, hydroids. Um, I'm just going to quickly show you them out of them. Um, label on the different species. Um, this one, Opinia elegans, it's really beautiful, it's really colourful. This is a, a studio shot. Um, one of the things that I have funding from DERA, and I'm based in Queens, and we're trying to build up DNA libraries for a lot of the marine vertebrates that we have particularly things where we're not sure um, of the, where there's taxonomic uncertainty, we're not sure what species they, they, they are, or we're not sure if they're invasive or something that's confused with an invasive, et cetera. Um, and I got DNA sequences from this species and also from these strange little white coils, which we, we knew were a, a, a spawn of some sort of uh, mollusks, but we didn't know what they belonged to. Um, so I've just done here a little um, 
gene tree for this particular barcoding gene marker that we were interested in. So that one of Phenia elegans, that was the red one in the photo, it's, it's identical to sequences that exist for that species from the Mediterranean. So we're, we're, we're quite confident that we're using that name correctly. And then for the spawn, and that spawn was collected actually of the scaries of Port Rush rather than Rathlin. Um, and it's um, matched with a spursa from, uh, that was available from a specimen from Brittany. Um, I would stick some fish in. I don't usually do fish in toads, but you know, people when you go underwater, they they often expect to see fish and they're surprised at all the other things they do see. This is a beautiful big lane, which is um, was just at the base of the, the wreck of the Loch Gary. Um, and you can also see these sea pens. Um, sea pens are another priority species and I'm sure they're there because they've been afforded protection from, from the wreck. I think if they had been further right, they probably would have been impacted by some of, some of the, the dredging activities. Um, so it's re really nice to see the life that's on the wreck, but also, you know, the, the whole surrounding seabed has benefited from having that wreck there. Um, this is an anglerfish, another, again, another Northern Ireland priority species. Um, I know Bernard often tells a tale of uh, an encounter he had with an absolutely enormous angler fish on Rathlin. And these things, you look at them, they're, they're basically a big mouth and, and not much else to them, you know. They're, so they think this thing went off because he it, grabbed it by the tail and it went off and then came back sort of opening and closing its, its jaws at him. So, um, they're quite impressive. And then the place, again, another priority species. Um, I've stuck a few things in that are just kind of nice fish to see. So this is the leopard spotted gooby. And then the cuckoo rats. And this is the, the males have this beautiful blue. Um, and they're one of the most um, colourful fish that you're likely to encounter in our waters. Again, you can just see how much life surrounds um, in the background. Um, if you manage to go night diving, you're, you're much more likely to see these little bobtailed squid at night than you were during the day. And they really are very cute. And the curled octopus, Aledna serosa, again, more likely to see it out and active and feeding at night time than, than during the day. This is a nocturnal sea anemone, which isn't on the Northern Ireland priority species list. I'm sort of surprised that it isn't because, you know, it's, it's certainly very scarce in its distribution. And then the Church Bay area. So you can see this is a, a large sandy area that's nestled within the, the L shape of the island. And um, you can see here on, on the multi beam the cemetery mapping the outline of the wreck of the HMS Drake. And in this sand, again, we have some species that we don't get anywhere else in Northern Ireland. This beautiful, beautiful burrowing sea anemone, Argnanthus sarcii, only known from Rathlin in, in Northern Ireland. And is it anywhere else in Ireland? I don't think it is. You think on other side? <laughs> Brenda thinks you might have seen one small one somewhere else, but there certainly aren't any records on MDI and I haven't seen it anywhere else. And then this uh, Nudibranch, Cuminotus bulmonti, again, another priority species. And there, there really is just, just there's so much that you could show from, from Rathlin. And uh, I was a bit, you know, I thought, oh, I'll do a quick sort of brief sketch of what you get in Rathlin. And then you go, oh my goodness, you know, where, where do you stop? There are so many things. So this is the sea pen, which um, again, populations of it in Church Bay, but a, 
priority species and again one that's very vulnerable to, to bottom fishing and uh, a slow growing long lived species so again it's great that we have the, the protection of the um, MZ Ed and, and the ban on the, the bottom fishing. Um, this is just, I think, it's a beautiful breakfast star, the euro of you, which you get on the sand there. It's quite large. It's about um, maybe 15 centimetres across. And the mast crab bristies. And this starfish astrocepta. Now this thing, you can see this beautiful glossy shell. It's a carnivorous sea snail that burrows in the sand and drills into little bivalves. If you're walking along the shore and you pick up little fine, small bivalve shells that have neat little holes drilled in them, then it, it, this might be the culprit. Um, so it feeds on other little bivalve mollusks. And when you dig it out from the sand, it sort of looks a bit like a poached egg. Scaphander. And then this is the rose coral, Pentaphora polyaceae. And again, it's something that's very vulnerable to, to bottom fishing because it's it's so brittle that any mobile gear run across that would just smash it up. And they can be quite slow growing. This one is probably about 20 to 30 centimetres across. It's probably quite old. And then the Danny Cornus Bay. Now this is the most, one of the most fantastic sites on, on the island. With all these beautiful sponges. If you look at some of them individually, this is this yellow hand-like sponge, Axinella dissimilis. It's likely to be very slow growing. So it could be, you know, it could be a hundred years old. And um, you know, we, we see almost undiscernible growth in, in these things and one of the things we would like to do going forward would be to have um, monitoring of a site like this where we can actually see how these things might change and look at growth, look at whether there's any recruitment, there's any disturbance um, or change. And then these cuts, cut shaped sponges, Axinella infundibuliformis. See here, this the really bright green iridescence on this cut coral, and then these encrusting sponges around. And again, you know, getting information on recruitment and growth in these things would be interesting. And then that's the accidental dummy forms that the, the little bay is named after. This is the football sea squirt, Diazona violace. Now, they call it a football because quite often they are the size of footballs. This is probably the size of two footballs. It's an absolutely enormous colony. And again, they, they tend to, they look like they die back in winter and all these suits get shed, but the base stays as a, you have a big solid mound and then these suits grow, grow again in the spring. Um, so we don't know how highly how they can be. We don't know much about the recruitment, so having some long-term static monitoring would help us to um, answer some of those questions. And then this is just a, a very pretty cushion store perennial for those. It's lovely and brightly coloured. And then some of the things that have changed on Rathlin, so um, perhaps as a consequence of climate change and our, our seas getting warmer and southern species coming further north. We look at these cut corals. So this is the normal cut coral, Paraphilius smithi. And you can see it looks really deformed. If we look at it a bit closely, it's this parasitic barnacle, Adna anglica. Now this photograph was taken um, in County Sligo in the summer of 2020, you can see that the, the cut corals really do have, sorry, quite a quite a significant parasitic load. Um, this photo was taken at the Skerries at Port Rush in the summer of 21. And you can see this cut coral has a, a couple of the barnacles on it. Um, then the summer just gone on Rathlin, 
So this is the cup coral caracodius smith eye. You see one, two, three, four, five parasitic barnacles on it. Another parasitic barnacle on that. And that was never recorded from Rathen before. It hadn't been recorded from Northern Ireland before. It's clearly becoming quite common and spreading. And we don't know what impact that has on that species. Does it interfere with its growth? Does it interfere with its reproduction? Or does it just make, make it look a strange shape? We, we've no idea. So again, by having uh, more monitoring, we will better understand what's what's going on. And we have really, you know, we do this Caracalia smithi and Caracalia emanata, the priority species. Um, they're the only two stony corals that we get uh, in Northern Ireland, and um, so um, we do. We do. We would be concerned about something like that. Um, and then the spread of invasive species here. Any any invasive species questions? I've got Dawn Diamond here, so she's the dearest uh, invasive species person, so she'll be able to answer your questions. But this is so. This is the marina on Rathman. Um, this kelp species with this broad um, midrib on it is uh, an invasive kelp um, called wakami, Ondaria panatifida. So that was first reported on Rathen when we were up there this summer. <laughs> I've got a photo to prove it. This is a, a specimen that I pressed of um, the Ondaria. Um, it's, it's very distinctive, this very broad um, midrib and then these pinnate fronds coming off like that. So it's 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 native to the temperate waters of um, Japan, China, and Korea, um, and it's it's been spread to a variety of places by boating activities and by um, aquaculture. On the National Biodiversity Network, is, these are the records of it. So the, the Rathbone record hasn't gone on yet, but you can see since it first being recorded in 2012, it is spreading. And again, you know, we, we wonder how are these things just going to be present or are they going to be a problem? And we really don't know. So again, that's why we monitor these things. But then sea squirts are always a problem for invasive species. And this one, which is called um, Astrocarpa humilis, the compass um, sea squirt, because it has these like compass rose markings around the siphons, um, is also up on that. Window. So um, I didn't want to finish on a negative invasive species note. So these are just a couple of the things that are in a new species um, that um, are so far like not described, so that that's but that we believe to be native and just things that are new to science. Um, so this is a sea squirt called this a, the Genesis botryloides. Again, we've got DNA sequences in it and we've got morphology that doesn't match um, other species. Um, we think it's a native species that just hasn't been described because we've got old photographs of it from Rathlin and the Maidens from the 1980s. So it seems like it's a, a native undescribed species that so far is only known from that North Channel area. Um, this is just a, a barcoding gene tree showing the, it was, this is this is the new species from Rathlin. It doesn't go with any of the um, other species of Botryloides. Um, Lichii is the, the one that is commonly known from around um, Ireland, and it's, it's, it's that and this invasive species, Vialasis, are the, are the two that we know about, but um, Digensis, possibly, but this one is, is in the others. We've also got non described species of. Nudibranch, a little dodo. You can see it here feeding on this hydroid, and this is its spawn coils. And then this beautiful sea anemone, which um, Bernard got on a one small gully on Rathlin Island and at one site on the west coast of Scotland. Um, doesn't look like any other anemone, and we we do have some friends who are sea anemone 
we're obviously an enemy expert and, and they've no idea what it is. So we need to collect a specimen, we need to get some DNA, and then we need to get that material to an expert who can hopefully um, give it a name. It's just a close-up. You can see how white and thick the base wood is. And I'll end there by thanking Bernard, who has really devoted uh, all of his life to probably far too much of it, to diving and taking underwater photographs of the marine life all around uh, uh, Ireland and Britain. Um, I'd like to thank um, the Deer Green Challenge Fund for um, providing funding for me, um, Queen's University Belfast, which is where I'm currently working, Ulster Wildlife for inviting me to give the talk, and all of you for uh, paying attention.